Pia Knudsen, and I come from Denmark, from Copenhagen. Some of you may remember me, I was here also here in May. Um, I have my own research site called Copenhagen UFO Research, where I try to research good Danish cases and uh, cases um, in and around Scandinavia. Besides that, I'm also the board member of the Danish exopolitics movement. Three weeks ago, we had a conference also similar like this in Copenhagen where Richard Dolan came. And that was a great success. It's always interesting. Uh, we also had Håkon Blomqvist from uh, UFO Sweden, who talked about the large archive they have uh, up in uh, Norrköping. And uh, then we had two people from Exopolitics, one from Germany and one from Portugal. Um, today I'll be speaking about this case, Operation Mainbrace case, and um, it's for me one of the most important military cases there's been in, in Scandinavia. And uh, sorry, I was just going to tell you a bit about myself. I had a UFO sighting when I was a child, and that's the reason I'm interested in this subject. Um, I was 10 years old, I was living in Canada with my family, and um, we were five people who saw a UFO at about 30 meters away from us, and 30 meters up, so it was very close. And uh, this is kind of the reason that I'm so interested in the subject. So, um, but today we're, we're going to be talking about this case that for me is very important. Um, and uh, just to get the perspective of the situation in 1952, I'm just going to go through a bit of the, the history of uh, what was going on at the time. During the Second World War, uh, there were these Foo Fighters that all these bomber pilots were seeing across uh, Europe. Uh, there was well over 2,000 sightings. Both the Allied uh, forces and the Germans saw it. Then uh, in 1946, there came a great wave of these ghost rocket sightings uh, in Scandinavia, but especially in Sweden. And uh, there was over 1,000 of these sightings of these cigar-shaped objects that were um, flying into lakes. People were seeing them fly into lakes on one day in uh, July of 1946. Four different sightings at four different lakes by people seeing them fly into these lakes. And uh, just a month ago, Klaus uh, Sven from UFO Sweden, he was up in the north of Sweden, and uh, he had a film crew and some divers, and they wanted to go into a lake and uh, see if they could find any, any witness uh, evidence of, of these uh, ghost rockets. There are still sightings of these uh, once in a while. It's, it hasn't completely stopped. Um, and of course, in 1947, just a moment, I'm just thirsty. There was, there was the Roswell case where they, uh, on the 7th of July, the military came out and said they had uh, retrieved a UFO in New Mexico. And just one day after, they went out and said, no, it wasn't a UFO. It was this high altitude weather balloon. But the two of the, of the three people in this uh, picture, they've gone on the record stating that it was a UFO and the Roswell case has well over 100 first and second hand witnesses stating that it really was a UFO they, they had uh, found and alien bodies. Because of uh, all of these sightings and uh, also public or civilian sightings, uh, the military intelligence agency uh, asked General Nathan Twining to come with an assessment about the phenomenon. And uh, this is known as the tw uh, Twining Memo, and you're able to go in and read this three-page document online. It's very interesting because um, in this document, uh, General Nathan Twining, he states that the phenomenon is uh, reported as something real and not visionary or fictitious. And he goes on to explain how they fly and what they look like. And it was because of this assessment that the first official UFO study uh, became a reality in the United States in uh, January of 1948 called Project Sign. Project Sign, they had collected all these uh, military sightings and they, they 
came with about 13 months after, they came with a report stating that they did believe that it could be of extraterrestrial uh, origin and uh, that they should uh, study the subject. But this was dismissed by the, the United States uh, Army saying uh, this, this couldn't be possible. So they closed down Project Sign and instead in 1949 they started Project Grudge. And uh, after six months of studying, they came with a 600-page report that stated that there was no evidence uh, that objects reported or are a result of an advanced sci scientific foreign development, and it was no threat to the national security. This was also s rejected somewhat, and uh, it was decided to close down this project also. They were also studying UFOs in uh, the United Kingdom and they had the Flying Saucer Working Party from 1951 to 1952. They came with a report that concluded that um, all inc incidences of, um, of UFOs was either mistaken identity, delusions or hoaxes. Also in Canada, they started a project in 1950 studying uh, UFOs called Project Ma Magnet. It kept running until the late 1950s. Then in uh, March of 1952, they, the Americans then launched the third and uh, final project studying UFOs. And this would become the longest running UFO project uh, lasting up till January of 1970. Because of the many sightings, also civilian sightings in America in and around uh, the beginning of the 1950s, the first private UFO organization, APRO, was uh, founded by uh, this couple, Jim and Coral Lorenzen. Uh, it's the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization. And uh, two months later, in this magazine, there came an article of a, don't look at Marilyn Monroe, but the right-hand corner, you'll see that uh, it states there's a case for interplanetary saucers. This was uh, some high-level people, generals and things, from the Pentagon that were now uh, asking the civilian public to come forward with their sightings and report them to the nearest Air, uh, Air Force. Um, and uh, they, they were interested in the civilian cases all of a sudden, not only the military, and that they did believe they could be of uh, interplanetary origin. In July of 1952, there came a great wave of UFO sightings across America. There were over 500 uh, sightings, and uh, in and around the Washington, D.C. area, there was uh, over 70 sightings. These were radar sightings, uh, both from the uh, Andrews Air Force Base and from the DC uh, airport that were picking up these radar sightings and uh, people were reporting a lot of sightings in the area. Then on the 26th of uh, July, 12 of these uh, saucers were seen in and around Capitol Hill and the White House and uh, this sighting was uh, caught on three different radars at the time. This, of course, uh, made a lot of headlines and uh, the public were kind of excited about the whole thing. The Air Force sent out jets to try to find out what it was and uh, they gave them the orders to shoot down these, um, these UFOs if they couldn't get them to land. Um, it was all over the media in the United States at that time. So the Pentagon, they held a press conference on the 29th of uh, July stating there, there were some, a small amount of cases they couldn't explain, but again, they reinforced that there was no uh, danger for the national security. But this tweaked uh, Winston Churchill, the prime minister in the, uh, the UK, his interest in this, what was all this stuff uh, with the U uh, UFOs, he wanted a report, so he sent this memo that's been released. Uh, he sent it to his uh, Secretary of Air and his scientific advisor, Lord Sherwell, asking what does it, this stuff amount to. 
He wanted the truth about the matter. This is uh, Frederick Lindemann, the Lord Sherwell, and uh, he dismissed the US sightings as mass psychology. So on July uh, 19, oh, uh, 1952, July 30th, just at the same time, a British um, fighter sergeant, he was down in uh, West Germany in a uh, training uh, exp expedition down there when he encountered a UFO up close and also radar confirmation of this sighting and uh, he when he came back he was debriefed not only by the Air Force the Royal Air Force but also by this man Lord Duncan Sandys <coughs> excuse me <laughs> who um, who was Winston Churchill's son-in-law and he was the Minister of Supply. This is a document that's also been released from the Uf, uh, UFO files in the, the UK. And it states here that he's involved in, in uh, debriefing this uh, Roland Hughes about his experience. He went on to have a discussion uh, with Lord Churchill about the matter and uh, at the time uh, Duncan Sandys was the Minister of uh, Supply and he would later go on to become the Defence Secretary in the UK. He writes uh, here, until some satisfactory scientific explanation can be provided, it would be most unwise to accept without further question the view that flying saucers can be dismissed as a mild form of hysteria. Sandys also wrote that there was ample evidence of something unfamiliar and, un and an un unexplained phenomenon. And now we're up to speed. Now we've uh, gotten to where this Operation Mainbrace is about to start. NATO was formed in uh, April of 1949. And in uh, December of 1950, the first Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in NATO was um, was chosen, and the person that was chosen to be this was uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. And uh, he would sit in this office uh, for two years, and one of the last things he did before leaving this office was to sign this agreement that Operation Mainbrace and some other operations around Europe should be done uh, with the NATO um, forces. He would then go back to the United States and run for the presidency, which he won in 1953. This operation was a Soviet containment strategy exercise, and uh, it was the first large-scale naval exercise which was undertaken by the newly established Allied Command Atlantic, uh, which was one of the two principal military commands of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. And um, there would, it just states here who's, uh, who was in charge of this, and uh, these were to be conducted in, in the fall of 1952. This Operation Mainbrace was to be, uh, was to take place in the North Atlantic Ocean. Uh, I can just try to see, yep, over here, and then in the UK, uh, the GI-UK gap, that's the Greenland, Iceland, and the UK gap, the waters in between here. In the Norwegian Sea, in the Barents Sea, in the North Sea, and around the, the Jutland Peninsula of Denmark, and up in the Baltic Sea. Many places where we read about this case, uh, it states that there were eight nations that was a part of this operation, but everything I found, official papers I found about it, states that there's nine nations. So I could be mistaken, but I've chosen to put the official one up here. Um, the United States, Belgium, Portugal, Canada, United Kingdom, Denmark, France, Norway, and the Netherlands were to conduct this uh, operation. And uh, the naval exercise ran from the 14th to the 25th of September 1952. 80,000 men were included, and women, I hope, uh, 200 ships and 1,000 aircraft. 
Just hours before the operation was about to start, the first UFO sighting happened. It was just here north of the Danish island Bonholm where um, the first sighting happened. It was uh, on board of this uh, ship, the Danish destroyer Vilmose. They were 10 nautical miles north of the island at the time and um, this is taken from Project Blue Book. Uh, this is an article from the New York Herald Tribune on the 15th of uh, September 1952. It states, Copenhagen Lieutenant Commander Smith Jensen, second in command of the Danish coastal destroyer Vilmos, has said today he observed a mysterious glowing object moving across the sky at great speed north of Bornholm last night and heading southeast. He described it as bluish glowing, a bluish glowing object, or triangle, sorry, and estimated the speed at 1,500 kilometers an hour. Um, I tried to include a, a, a small interview I've done in my PowerPoint, and it only works half of the time, so I've chosen not. So I just have to close down, because I've interviewed Nils Jensen, the son of uh, the commander, so, just be a moment. Uh, hello, Nils. Welcome. Thank you for giving me this. Do you tell me a bit about yourself, who you are, what you work with, and what connection you have to the 1952 Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, Nils Peter, Smidinson, and son of my father, who is who is uh, the, the key witness here. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm just the second witness uh, from all the articles that was written in uh, 1952 uh, about this uh, observation from my father. Uh, daily I'm working as a, an architect at home and I'm just myself, so, uh, and I'm 57 years old and uh, have uh, written and got all those uh, tales from my father. But so <coughs> your father, he, he spoke to you on a number of times, uh, quite a few times about this case? Not uh, that many times, but he, he mentioned it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, well, he, he didn't uh, tell it as a joke, but he, because he still doubted, he was a, a doubting person, and uh, he, he, he let the doubt uh, get into here and, uh, become a, the story, because uh, uh, at, at this time he was uh, out, he was taking the, the watch, and it's outside on this uh, old uh, Villemos, not old, but now it's not anymore. Uh, the sister ship Villemos and Wittfeld had their, uh, their, their, their interest was to, to guard in this main brace. Uh, yeah. Uh, they were a coastal ship that were guarding uh, They were around, supposed uh, to guard up in the northern part of uh, Bornholm. At, uh, in the Baltic ten, Sea, yeah? Baltic Sea, yeah. yeah. It's about 10 sea mile, nautical sea miles. Uh, they are at this time about 10 o'clock in the night. And it's just before the, the exercise uh, starts, actually. Okay, uh, I'm just going to ask a bit more, uh, more about your father. Your father's name uh, was Geo and uh, he had uh, started in the, the mid-1930s in the Navy. 38. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, he kept, kept getting promoted up during the war. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. And at this time, in 1952, he's uh, the lieutenant commander and uh, the second in charge on the ship. That's correct. Yes. Um, so your father was really accustomed to the uh, life on a, on a ship and had been sailing for many years. So he he did know what to look for that could be of uh, of interest to a military ship if it was he, in the sea or in the sky. Or uh, during the war already, he was uh, uh, actually doing some observations on. Uh, the B, uh, B1 uh, bombing machines that Germans was uh, uh, doing experiments with down at Stilms uh, in the southern part of Zealand. 
Okay. And it's, so they were. Uh, I've actually seen some uh, drawings and some uh, not photos but drawings from their their flights. Okay. That was uh, uh, jets. So he knew about jet engines and all that, uh, and he knew about the stars because he was a, a amateur astronomer. A, a astronomer, right? And um, and he was very good through the education as a naval officer. Uh, and one of his specialty was uh, uh, the, what do you call that? Uh, uh, Giving different types of ships and long distance uh, observations. observations to to find out that that's the type of ship. Yeah, he, so, so he was very good at. Um, he was a specialist in this area. He, he was actually. Okay. And, and um, so that's why it's very interesting that he's coming up with this uh, uh, observation here. Yeah. Because he couldn't find out and he couldn't spot it in any other thing. Okay. It was not a jet, and it was bigger, but he could still. Uh, talk about the speed. Yeah. He was talking about fifteen hundred kilometers an hour, and uh, to to say that, you have to know how far away it is. I mean, you have to say, well, it's about like yeah. approximately like that. And he knew that airplanes was fine with that speed and that speed. So, uh, and a rocket comes with another speed. Uh, you can go out and see a, a a bullet from a cannon. You can actually follow it with your eyes. If you know where to look, so he knew about speed. Yeah, and he uh, he had a really uh, uh, good education uh, that made him a qualified expert to, to make these judgments on how quick and how fast and what type of aircraft or what type of um, ship uh, at a long distance uh, yeah. he was able to to make these uh, j um, evaluations. Okay. Um, on the 13th, uh, in the late evening of the 13th of September 1952, shortly before midnight, that's that's as close as I've got, and you say around uh, 10 o'clock? 20 minutes past 10. Yeah, so that's pretty accurate, around uh, close to midnight. And um, then, where is your father and these other witnesses standing on the ship at the time um, where they see... Um, they have the whole... Uh, ship uh, f filled with journalists, journalists, journalists. Yeah. Uh, and um, but, and they're sitting down in the in the mess, in, in the, the officers mess. mess. Uh, but but he's just getting up on the bridge, and it's an outside bridge on, okay. on the boat, so they have the sky just above him, and he's there with a uh, another naval officer, and a photographer, and I think. I think the fourth one was also a, a journalist, maybe. Uh, but, but, uh, and they see this observation. Uh, this is all uh, from, from the storytelling. But uh, they see this, and the photographer says he, he wants to take the picture. But in the, if you have ever seen a boat, there's a metal uh, hule shelf. Sh shelf. Uh, yeah. And and he takes his camera because he wants to take a picture of this one but he smashes his camera up to this metal frame and his camera gets busted so uh, no picture that's too bad. bad that would have been really and interesting and you have to be very quick also to take a night of course. photo at that yeah. time anyway mm -hmm. but uh, we do have a picture of, uh, of the people uh, on board the ship yeah. I'll be putting this uh, yeah. as part of the interview uh, uh, a picture up on, on who was there at the time. Um, so they're standing on, on the bridge and out, outdoors and uh, they they hear a sound, I believe. I've read they, they heard some kind of a sound. Has your father said what it sounded like? Uh, I hear this whistling sound. A kind of a whistling yeah, sound. Yeah, because you couldn't, there wasn't the engine. You couldn't hear the, if, it, if there was an engine, but you could see those three lights and mm -hmm. it, appear to be blue or green actually yeah uh, there's in the articles you can see green and blue uh, yes I have read both yeah. also uh, so maybe perhaps it's a a bit of both but he could see that yeah. it was a delta thing it was a three-angled delta thing it was a triangular, triangular. Sh 
triangular shaped object with a light in each corner. Reminds me about the new. Uh, yeah, the new uh, stealth. Uh, the stealth flight. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Maybe it was the early one. I don't know, but uh, no, it, that didn't exist at that time. Okay, um, where did where did it come from? From where your father was standing, did it come to the left of him, behind him, to the right, in front of him? Did, has he spoken of? Ex no, no. The only part is that it's going uh, in the northeastern direction. Okay. With that speed and uh, with that color, and it disappears that way. Okay. And uh, so then we can draw one line, but it came in one straight line. One straight line. Yeah. Okay. During uh, the main brace uh, exercise from the 14th to the 25th of September, at the moment, I'm up at around seven or eight different UFO sightings and USO sightings uh, during these uh, twelve days, ex uh, this, these twelve day exercises. Um, did your father have any contact with any of the other cases, uh, or see anything else during uh, the, his time in the the main brace uh, exercise? No, no, not no, not as I know. Um, um, what happened after they had seen it? What did your father do with the, this observation? Well, he goes to his uh, captain, Wolf, uh, Wolf Hagen, I think his name was, uh, who's down in the mess with the other journalists. And, uh, but they don't believe him in the right minute he's coming in. And he wants it to, to, to report it uh, to the ship's journal. Uh, but then uh, the captain hears from the from the photographer too and two others so that he, there's witnesses it's not a, a, a it's not a so drunken sea a sailor who's talking no and and, and my father was uh, and uh, has always been a, a person that you could uh, trust when mm -hmm. he says one thing it's uh, he's not he's never been a liar uh, he's no. always been very trustful yeah he's he can, a trust he can, he can make many person. jokes he's always been a good joker but uh, there's a difference between the and he was very and serious about this uh, report work yeah, yeah. and, um, and uh, as I told you about the resistance uh, yeah before that uh, that it was very important to to uh, trust people mm -hmm. it, it means the death life yeah. or death for a lot of persons yeah. your yeah. father was a resistance man under the Second World War and yeah, had yeah. to trust in people with his life, uh, to, exactly. to uh, I mean, try to give some resistance to the German occupation of uh, Denmark. Yeah, it's things that we we yeah. uh, don't really understand uh, today, but I can believe how it is. It was at that time mm -hmm. where you didn't know who was your enemy and who was to be trusted. Okay. So that's why when when he tells things like this, uh, at at that time, and he. He's he's honest. He don't know what it is, and that's what UFO is uh, the words for. Yeah, it's, uh, un it's un unidentified and it's a uh, object. So yeah. he's uh, saying, well, I can't uh, uh, tell you what this is, but it's weird, and I, I haven't seen it before, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that's what he brought on uh, as as tale. So he gives this information to the captain, and the captain writes it down in the report log. It should actually be in going into a NATO log because this was a NATO, and I know that exercise. Yes, NATO and I have exercise. also read that um, that it went into the uh, into a report on the ship, and then it was sent to the NATO main brace headquarters in yeah. in England because it was a NATO uh, operation. So they got the report. Um, okay. Let's see. So there were four people who saw the object. They were standing on the bridge that evening. Um, I have found a news article <coughs> in the Project Blue Book. This is uh, the American official study of UFOs um, that also started in 1952. In their papers, I found a newspaper clippings from the New York Herald Tribune that stated the 15th of September 
And this happened on the evening of the 13th of December. I'm really puzzled how it got so quick from uh, it happened into the New York uh, Herald Tribune and your father's name is named in this article. Do you have any idea if your father spoke with the press or how it was leaked? Well, he spoke with the press. There was eight press uh, office uh, press uh, people on board of the ship so but how would they uh, they didn't get into uh, they didn't get off the boat uh, until a couple of days later so uh, what, or a week later sorry so i don't know i find it I, I i do know there was a this photographer on board maybe the it could also be that it's uh, the dating is wrong I, not not uh, what I've been able to find. Uh, it shouldn't be wrong. This uh, should really be the date of uh, when it happened. But uh, on the 17th of uh, uh, September, the Danish newspaper Politiken has an article running about it, also where your father's name's uh, involved. Yeah. And in this article, it sounds like he's uh, he's spoken to them. And perhaps this is one of the journalists that, that was on board uh, they got a statement from him. I, I understand that. It, I just found it uh, very interesting that halfway across the, the <laughs> world, they, they about uh, a day and a half later, had already put his name in yeah. and things. But it wasn't something you've heard that he took contact to them or... No. Uh, no. no. It, it just no, spread. He, yeah, he, he, he's not that type. No. Also. Now, he gives a report, uh, of course, to his... Uh, uh, Commanding. Commander, and that's it. Yeah. yeah, he keeps the the military or the yeah. navy way of doing it, and that's okay. That's great. <laughs> um, I'm on now. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, Nilsi spoke very fondly of his father, and his father went on to have a really glorious uh, military career and was uh, in the military until his retirement uh, in the late 60s. Um, and he kept stating uh, that, that his father would, you know, he was really puzzled by it and he would, n he would never make fun with this kind of uh, thing. This is a picture that I've gotten from Nils. This is of his father, Gail. And um, this is the picture he was speaking about where the journalists are sitting down in the officer's mess during Operation Main Brace. This has never been seen by anyone but the family. This is uh, one of the Danish newspapers that were writing about it at the time. And um, this w had, was uh, Gio's own newspaper clippings from the time and uh, it's not something that's uh, commonly seen in Denmark or anywhere this article and it, in this one it's from the Associated Press and the headline is the flying triangle is difficult to figure out it speaks about the the press uh, photographer that was on board because he was working for this newspaper and uh, everything that Nils just talked about is also confirmed in here the sound, the whistling sound, and the, the shape and things. And uh, the photographer's name is Blomberg. And uh, I found him. The man is 90 years old and, uh, to my surprise, still living and living at home together with his wife. And was 91, or uh, his wife is 91 and he's 90. And uh, he has been a very big figure in the Danish uh, press photographer uh, he was the head of the Association for the Press Photographers in Denmark. And uh, he remembered the story and confirmed everything from the news articles. He wasn't interested in getting interviewed uh, on film, but um, he did confirm everything. This is uh, the article I was speaking about from the Politiken on the 17th, uh, where um, Nils Smidjen, or excuse me, Aguirre Smidjensen was speaking about it. Everything uh, in there is also stating the shape and the sound and the speed. But at the bottom, uh, he also says that they were they found uh, it made a, a real impact on them. They, 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 were, they were shocked about this sighting, uh, the, the four witnesses that saw it. 
I went to the Danish National Archives and uh, I tried to get a hold of some information about the ship, what happened on the ship and things. And it took me between two and three months. In the beginning they said uh, it was a closed uh, file, I, couldn't, I wasn't allowed access to it. And then they said, okay, I could perhaps get access, but I had to give a really good reason why I should get it. And I waited two months. And when the day they came and they said I was allowed to see it, they said they had been mistaken that the file really was open. So I went in, I was oh, very excited, I was going to see the, the file on the case, and I got very um, disappointed. There was nothing in there about the, the sightings, the only thing was how the ship was being mainta uh, maintained, and um, that they had got new electrical equipment on board. The only thing that maybe perhaps was interesting was they were having a lot of malfunctions during this time with their equipment. So um, there, there wasn't really anything of interest. They also had very many disciplinary uh, situations on board, and which wasn't common. So it was written in there that there were obviously a lot of problems on board the ship. Uh, the next sighting would come here uh, in, in the UK. And uh, this is a radar sighting from Needy's Head in Norfolk in the, the UK. The man uh, who's speaking about this is Frank William Redfern, the man on the right. And uh, some of you may recognize the, the man on the left. This is Nick Redfern, a very famous uh, UFO researcher. He, in this book, uh, Nick has written very many books, but in this book, A Covert Agenda, um, he talks about his father's sightings during Operation Main Brace. And um, I, contacted Nick and I asked if he was willing to give me a statement or an interview about his father's sightings. His father's still living and, and uh, he's 80 years old. And he agreed to that, but Nick's uh, Skype connection is almost uh, totally, he can't get repaired. He's tried and tried with different experts, so we couldn't use Skype and Nick lives in Texas. So we had to be creative. <clears throat> I got up at four o'clock in the morning and I took my MP3 microphone recorder and then I phoned him and put him on loudspeaker. So that's maybe says something, oh, sorry, a little bit about the quality of this, but um, it is interesting to hear. Now, if you... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. It's just so... Just try... There. Now, if you... My name's Nick Redfern, and my father is Frank Redfern, and from 1950 to 1953, my father was in the British Royal Air Force. Um, this was a time when the British government had something called national service, where every young man over the 18 had to do three years of military service. And my father was interested in aircraft, and so he chose the Royal Air Force, and he trained as a radar mechanic. And he was stationed at several Royal Air Force bases on the east coast of England during the course of the three years he was with the Royal Air Force. Um, but in September 1952, he was stationed at a Royal Air Force base called Neatis Head, which is on the east coast of England. And this was at the height of a, a NATO exercise called Main Brace, which was taking place in the English Channel and the North Sea. And it involved various nations, the UK, uh, the United States, um, various Scandinavian countries. And it was like a large-scale military exercise designed to basically show the Russians or display to the Russians the sort of scale of strength that existed in Europe in the event that the Russians might want to launch some sort of uh, surprise attack on, on Britain and, and mainland Europe. And my father was involved in three strange UFO incidents during the course of Exercise Main Brace and they all occurred at night over a three-night period. And basically 
they involved um, the radar operators tracking these very fast-moving, high-flying objects, almost like a fleet of them, that were travelling from the direction of Scandinavia towards the British coastline. And although these objects were flying at tremendous speeds and, and equally tremendous heights, um, the first thought was, being it was at the height of the Cold War, well, this has to be some sort of sneak attack by the Soviet Union. And so um, Royal Air Force fighter planes were quickly sent into the air from a nearby Air Force base called Coltishall. And the, the pilots uh, logged on or locked on to the air, these unidentified objects, whatever they might have been, and tried to give chase. But whatever these UFOs were, they were flying at um, extremely fast speeds and kind of played like a game of chase or cat and mouse with the air crews and the pilots chased them all across the, the North Sea for hours and eventually had to return to base because they were running low on fuel. And the only thing the pilots could say for sure was that they could see these very bright lights in the distance that seemed to be able to carry out all sorts of strange manoeuvres like left and right hand turns at incredible speeds. Um, and this occurred on the second night as well, in the sort of hours after midnight through the early hours of the morning and then on a third night. Um, and that was the last night of these events that my father was involved in during May Embrace. Um, but when the encounters were over, everybody who was involved, such as the pilots, the, the radar operators, and people like my father who worked on the radar systems, they were all basically taken into a room and reminded of the fact that they'd signed the British Government Secret Act and told you won't talk about this under any circumstances whatsoever. And my father didn't say anything about it until I was probably about 13. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. He was almost finished. <laughs> Ow, it, it's not normally so. I'm sorry. Just going nuts. Yeah, here. Um, Nick would go on to say that there was taken uh, some film about um, from these pilots that were sent up. They took film, and this film, of course, was never seen again. He didn't mention in this, but he did mention to me that that uh, they came and collected all information there, w there was, all these uh, radar files, and took them away, and then they told them that they had signed this uh, secrecy uh, agreement in the military and not to speak of it. Um, then, um, I'm just gonna, the next, uh, his father couldn't exactly remember the dates on uh, the three uh, nights that happened, but he believed it was at this time because there was a sighting in the next day in the area where these were flying northeast. It's a civilian sighting, and this is from the CIA uh, files, where uh, here in Norway at Kirkenes, uh, on the 18th, there were three forestry workers working when they saw this uh, big object that was hovering, just hovering still. It was about 15 to 20 meters in diameter. Uh, and. Um, then it just flew off at an incredible speed. That's as close as Nick's father could uh, get, Frank uh, Redfern, to what date these happened. The next sighting was maybe per, uh, perhaps the most um, famous of the sightings because it had a lot of media attention in the UK. It was uh, on September the 19th at Topcliffe in Yorkshire in England. They were standing uh, five different airmen at the base watching one of these types of plane, a Gloucester meteor, descending to come back to the base when they, they uh, see this, this um, object flying close behind it. And um, it was flying slower and then it started descending just like a leaf that's fallen off a tree. And then it stopped and then it started turning around in its own axis, and then it just flew off at a, an incredible speed. 
and uh, these airmen had never seen anything like it. There were also civilian sightings in the area of the same thing that was happening. Um, this was uh, in all different kinds of newspapers in the UK at the time and uh, got a lot of media attention. Um, the next sighting that would come in Denmark uh, on the peninsula of, uh, of Jutland in Denmark at the Kaup Air Base on the 20th, 1952. There's, um, there's one story out there, uh, and I'm just going to read it, but there's a, a w the witness says differently. Uh, while Operation May Race was in full swing nearby the North Sea during September of 1952, a shining, apparently metallic disc was seen by, on the 20th by three Danish Air Force officers at 7.30 p.m. Uh, the UFO sped over Cap Airfield, Denmark, disappearing into the clouds to the east. This is the one of the four, uh, three witnesses, and he states that in his uh, written testimony that there, there were four people there. Kurt Abelsko is uh, now dead, but uh, he had a long uh, career in the military, 41 years, and um, he states that not only these four men saw it, but they contacted the radio uh, or the radar station at the airbase, and they couldn't pick anything up, but all the, the people in the radar station came out and also saw the objects. It wasn't just one object, it was a very large object and four small objects that were flying around the larger object. Um, their radar only went up to 7,000 meters and it was above that, that's why they couldn't track this. At the same time on the base, uh, the Kaab Air Base, the people who weren't involved in the main base uh, exercise, they were out on an a exercise on the base so there was a whole group of people also at the base that were doing uh, kind of an exercise or interiorring exercise that also saw it. So there might be at least 20 witnesses at the base that, that saw it, and not only these three. The next sighting would come in the North Sea, and uh, it would be on board also on the 20th, uh, approximately the same time as the last uh, sighting at Kaup. And uh, it was on board the Franklin USS Franklin D. Roosevelt, the aircraft carrier. Uh, it was seen by all the people uh, up on the flight deck and above the flight deck. One of the witnesses that saw it was a photographer that was on board, Wallace Litwin. Oh, that was nice. Uh, Wallace Litwin and. Um, he was uh, taking pictures of these planes uh, coming in and flying off the aircraft carrier when all of a sudden they sighted. Um, he was standing, at what I could see, he was standing up in this area. And then he took the first of three pictures. The two of them I've been able to locate. This is the next one. Um, he. Um, he took these two pictures and uh, there were, of course, a lot of people on the ship, but also ships around the, the Roosevelt also saw it. At first they thought it might be some kind of a balloon that was sent up from one of the other uh, ships. So they checked and double checked and even they checked four times the different ships. That's at least what uh, the head of the Blue Book project, um, Edward Ruppelt, has said that they kept checking, but no one had sent up any balloons, so it was still an unknown. And the, the next sighting here, and the, the last sighting, was also in the North Sea. I haven't been able to find much information about this, but uh, it is in Project Blue Book, so there must be some kind of a report on it. It was uh, six British pilots that were flying in formation and flying back to the UK when they spotted a UFO. They saw it for, uh, for some time, but then lost it for a minute or two. And then it again reappeared, and um, one of the pilots turned around and tried to, um, to pursue the UFO, and uh, the UFO just outmaneuvered uh, 
the jet. This is a complete sighting map of sightings of uh, what happened during the 12 days. And um, I think that's quite a lot for uh, action around, uh, in and around Scandinavia one time. <laughs> There's been a lot of talk about there also were U USOs, this, these underwater UFOs, but I haven't found anything really, witness statements or um, any documents that's really confirmed it. I know there's, perhaps there has been these uh, USO sightings. There's been USO sightings in Norway and in the Baltic Sea at other times, so it could very well be, but this one that's uh, dated, that's uh, all around the internet, states that three Danish officers participating in the multinational exercise observe a USO that approaches their ship and hovers a while and then disappears. It's never been in any um, UFO researcher papers or something I've heard about in Denmark. So I don't know who these officers are. The aftermath of the case, um, Nick Redfern talked to me about that there was a p report at the National Archives in the UK that said reports on possible repercussions in Denmark. These were kept uh, uh, out of reach for the public for uh, yeah, 58 years or something. Uh, they were even uh, have been held longer time than some Soviet uh, information about the time, this period frame. So whatever was in this report is really interesting and I have gone in and found out that this uh, report is now opened and I have gotten uh, everything ready and the last email I got sadly was yesterday. So I haven't been able to get a hold of and find out what is in this there was a lot of political turmoil just before Oper Operation Mainbrace because the Soviet had helped Denmark clear the island of Bornholm in 1946. And the Soviets claimed that the Danish made an agreement there would never come a foreign um, uh, military establishment on the island again, never. And when Operation Mainbrace was to take place, they were supposed to land on the island and do some different exercises and the Soviets got really upset with them. Uh, it went all the way up to the highest level in the United States, in NATO, in the UK and in Denmark and there are a lot of uh, public records about the discussions in the parliament in Denmark about if the Soviets were right. I think perhaps maybe some of that could be in here. I'm not expecting too much about UFOs since all of that is under the NATO. Uh, yeah, they, they're keeping this uh, information at NATO. But uh, it could be interesting to see if there was something in there. And they wanted 135 pounds to see that. That's 1,400 Norwegian. And I am a student at the moment, so I just kind of have to save up for that one, I think. Um, the, the next part of the aftermath was that a senior air intelligence officer, Wing Commander Miles Formby, who had played a leading role in the UK Flying Saucer Working Party. He had close links to the US uh, Air Force and um, he was sent three weeks um, to the United States to work on the UFO problem. There's docu documentation for this. This is from David Clark. He's a researcher who's been working closely with uh, the National Archives and uh, uh, has uh, come up and found a lot of information in the files in the UK. Um, even though they, during the working saucer, or the Flying Saucer Working Party, had decided not to uh, investigate UFOs, this document shows that they did still keep collecting UFO uh, sightings, both uh, military and uh, civilian sightings, and that they should be sent to this uh, part of the, the intelligence office. Um, and this is, again, something David Clark has found. There's been many UF and uh, even USO sightings surrounding uh, USS Franklin D. Roosevelt. Uh, and why 
this could perhaps be is because they were the first ship that was ever um, um, ever had nuclear weapons on board. And that happened in, uh, I believe, 1950 or 51, just before uh, main brace. They had nuclear weapons on board. And there's a big connection between uh, nuclear things and UFOs. So, and there are several reports that it, all during the 1950s, they kept having sightings uh, all around the world. The first head of the Blue Book project was Edward Ruppelt, and um, he, um, he wrote this book that he released in 1956 after leaving Project Blue Book called The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. You can read this book online for free. Um, in this book uh, surrounding the main brace case, he stated that uh, before the operation even happened, that someone at the Pentagon had said, be on the lookout for U uh, UFOs. Uh, the Royal Air Force, uh, uh, Ruppelt says, the, the Royal Air Force officially recognized UFOs after the main brace case and the sightings in and around this time. The Ministry of Defense in the UK, they, um, after, I'm just going to read, the Flying Saucer Working Party's recommendation that UFO sightings should not be investigated was overturned by the mid-50s, and two air ministry divisions were uh, actively involved in investigating UFO sightings. So the UFO desk was created, and it's from here that a lot of these uh, UFO files are being released uh, up during the, yeah, from 2004 and on, I believe it was. We just, uh, I mean, it's the 60th anniversary of this case this year, and when will all the files be released? I mean, I know that there should be things in Denmark. Uh, they have released some of their files in Denmark, but only 329 cases. And all cases in Denmark have gone missing from before 1978. It was, um, it, Every time they came a sighting uh, reported to the Air Force in Denmark, they had to send a copy to the military intelligence agency in Denmark. So they do have a complete file. So even though it go, it's gone missing in the Air Force division, they should have a complete file in the intelligence uh, part of it. And um, so I know for sure there's more information there. And the United States and uh, the United Kingdom has been pretty open and been releasing a lot of things. That's the end of my lecture, and uh, if anybody has any questions, you can just uh, ask. I have a microphone. Or... Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for listening.